turn with me in your Bibles this afternoon to Mark chapter 10. I will have one more message uh, to conclude our sermon series, refuting the error of historicist eschatology. I'm setting that subject aside for a couple of weeks to address other issues. For today, I want to take a, a fresh look at this story here in Mark chapter 10 that we know as the story of the rich young ruler. This account that we have recorded here in the 10th chapter of Mark's Gospel, which is also recorded in uh, Matthew chapter 19 and Luke 18, refutes the common lie that most people in this world hold to, which is the idea that good people go to heaven and bad people go to hell. A lot of people have that misconception. Good people go to heaven, bad people go to hell. I'm good, so I get to go to heaven. That's what a lot of people think. How many times have we been out knocking on doors uh, folks uh, tell me they're on their way to heaven, and I ask them, how do they know that? How do you know that you're on your way to heaven? Only to hear them give you know, the common phrase and reply, because I'm a good person. They have been deceived by the devil into thinking that they can merit eternal life by their own works or just by being a good person. And that characterizes most people in society today. And then also there are Two other big lies that have been propagated through modern day pop Christianity. One of those big lies is the abominable lie that the Lord Jesus taught a gospel of salvation by works. That was directed specifically and only to Old Testament Jews. And the second of those big lies is the abominable lie that repentance from sin is not an essential element of saving faith or part of the gospel. For many years, the primary propagators and perpetrators of these last two big lies have been so-called independent, fundamental Baptist churches, many of whom claim to derive their doctrine from the King James Bible alone. All three of these big lies actually are refuted in this wonderful story in Mark chapter 10 when the words of the Lord Jesus are properly and rightly understood. To get some context here, the events of this chapter actually occur toward the end of Christ's earthly ministry. Jesus is on his last journey into Jerusalem here in this story, knowing full well, but having set his face like flint, the Bible says, to endure what awaited him there. And here he has just come down into the regions of Judea from Galilee in the north. In verse 1 to 12 of the chapter, uh, the Pharisees question Jesus about divorce. And in verses 13 to 16 then, Children were brought to the Lord Jesus to be touched by him. We read in verse 13. And they brought young children to him that he should touch them. And his disciples rebuked those that brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased and said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of God. Verse 15 Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. And he took them up in his arms, put his hands upon them, and blessed them. Before we move on to the main event, there are two things that we need to observe here. First of all, Jesus says here very clearly that children can understand spiritual things. They can understand the gospel and they can receive the kingdom of God. And children, by the way, need to hear the gospel and the teaching and the preaching of the word of God just as much as adults do. I don't see a separate children's church anywhere in the Bible. During Brother Jade's uh, excellent first hour lesson, we covered Ephesians 6 verse 1, where the Apostle Paul speaks directly to children. He says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And then the next two verses also are directed to children. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. Personally, I find it very interesting and worth noting that Paul did not say in verse 1, Fathers, teach your children to obey their parents. Although he does in effect say that in verse 4. But here in verses 1 through 3, somewhat as the Lord Jesus says in our text, Suffer the little children to come unto me, Paul addressed the children directly rather than indirectly through the parents. That indicates to me 
that in sending this letter to be read uh, in the church at Ephesus, Paul knew or perhaps presumed that the parents would have their children right there in a meeting with them, learning the very same thing that the parents were learning. I think it's safe to presume that. That, by the way, of course, is the pattern for our assembly in this church as well. We do have some baby noise at times, and so we've got a cry room over there for moms or dads to take their cry babies to during those moments. But we don't have a children's church or a separate youth program here because when our church assembles, we want the children hearing the same preaching and teaching that the parents are getting. Second point here from Mark chapter 10, verse 15, is that an adult hearing the gospel, rightly presented, must be able to put away his pride and humble himself in order to receive the gospel and to be saved. Jesus said, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. In saying that, the Lord Jesus is saying that a man must be willing to humble himself as a little child. We read similar words in Matthew 18. At the same time, verse 1, came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called the little child unto him, and set him in the midst of them, and said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted, and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said, Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Adults must be able to, who have not been saved yet, must be able to humble themselves to come to Christ to be saved. Young children are very humble by nature. It's not until they become teenagers that they decide that they already know everything. Some people say that when a child becomes 14, you need to lock him in a box and it has holes in it so he can breathe, then when he turns 16, you need to plug the holes. I disagree with that theory and line of thinking. By the way, I believe the story of Daniel and his three friends show us it's, it is possible to raise your kids right so that they will, even as teenagers, as Jay was talking about first hour, determine, or younger, determine to serve the Lord, to serve God, and not to defile themselves with the king's meat, as Daniel and his three friends did or not to defile themselves with the things of the world. That's possible. It's rare in today's world, but it is possible. For either a teenager or an adult to do so, he must be able to humble himself as a little child, to be teachable and to have ears that are open to correction. The gospel, rightly presented, forces everyone who would receive it to acknowledge that he is nothing without God and that he's a dirty, rotten sinner in need of salvation that he needs to turn in repentance from his sin and from his pride, which we're about to see clearly demonstrated here in Mark chapter 10. Verse 16, And he took them up in his arms, put his hands upon them, and blessed them. Verse 17, And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? First we read here, when he was gone forth into the way. At this point in Matthew's parallel account, we read this in Matthew 19, verse 15. And he laid his hands on them and departed thence. In other words, Jesus had stopped briefly here at this place on his way to fulfill the mission he had in Jerusalem. He had concluded his ministry at that place and he was continuing into the way, meaning back on the road to Jerusalem and there to be crucified. The Passover was drawing near, and that road was no doubt crowded with travelers going to Jerusalem for Passover. Then we read in verse 17, And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running. We read in all three synoptic Gospels that this one that came running was a rich man. Very rich, we read here. We know from Matthew's Gospel that the man was young in Matthew 19, verse 20. We know from Luke's gospel that the man was a ruler, uh, probably a ruler of the synagogue. Luke, Luke 18, verse 18 says, And a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So he was either a ruler of the synagogue or a silver ruler, possibly a member of the Sanhedrin. Therefore, 
We refer to this account for this story, of course, as the story of the rich young ruler. Mark says here that the young man came running. That, by the way, is a detail that Matthew and Luke both leave out of the story. This young man had heard that Jesus was leaving, and he had urgent business that he needed to resolve with the master. He probably had to run, actually, to catch up with Jesus because Jesus was probably walking at a very fast pace to fulfill his mission. Reminds me of the story of David and Goliath. David ran to the battle, we read there in 1 Samuel 16. And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and uh, drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. When we do know God's will, we ought not to delay in doing it. As Jade mentioned here, first hour also, obedience is to be immediate, not delay. We should hurry to do God's will and never delay. This young man had to run to catch up with Jesus because Jesus knew his father's will. He was doing his father's will and he wasn't going to uh, delay getting that done. He had set his face as flint to grow up to Jerusalem, knowing what awaited him there, but he was not delaying to do his father's will. So this rich young ruler came, uh, running up to catch him, and then we read, and kneeled to him. We read that he kneeled to him. This young man had urgent business with the Lord Jesus. He lowered himself uh, to a point of expressing public humility, actually, on this road that's probably crowded with lots of people, uh, to get Christ's attention and to seek his counsel. It's possible that uh, the young man is just putting on a show here. I don't think so, though. I doubt that's the case since he came running and he kneeled to him. He may have been under the conviction of the Holy Spirit or under the conviction of his own conscience. But from the dialogue here, it appears possible that, or maybe even more likely, that this young man was a student of theology uh, who had respect for this famous rabbi who drew huge crowds and wanted to. And he may have wanted to increase his learning. Uh, he'd heard that Jesus taught with authority, not as the scribes of the Pharisees. And so he showed the Lord Jesus due respect. And so he asked him, Good Master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? The term master there was, of course, commonly used of teachers or rabbis, especially teachers of the law. He said here, good master. By this, of course, the young man conveys that he thought Jesus to be not only a good man, but also a good teacher. That he was one that came from God and taught good doctrine. And that's what compelled him, of course, to run after him. Verse 18. And Jesus said unto him, why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Verse 19, Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Defraud not. Honor thy father and mother. They recited those six commandments to the young man. Verse 20, And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. I thought he was a good man. Verse 21, Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him, said unto him, one thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross, and follow me. And he, we read in verse 22 then. And he, the young man, he was sad at that saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. First, Jesus says in verse 18, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. I've heard many sermons on this topic, preached from this text, and typically the point is made here that Jesus wants this man to see that he is in fact far more than a good teacher, that he is in fact God in human flesh. As we all know, Jesus was in fact fully God and fully man, God in human flesh. He was, in fact, far more than a good teacher or a healer or a physician. He was, in fact, the only truly good man that ever lived because he alone, in fact, was sinless. But in my opinion, that's not really why Jesus asked this question. In the dialogue here, I would say that the, that the Lord Jesus didn't want this young man to see who Christ was at this time, at this point, nearly as much as he wanted this young man to first see himself for the sinner that he was. I believe that Jesus asked the question because he knew this young man's heart. Even before the man came running, of course, 
He knew that this young man thought that he was good and that he was, in fact, blameless. All these have I kept from my youth, he said in verse 20. This young man said, sin is not my problem. I've kept the commandments. Sin is not my problem. He may have thought to himself, well, at least these six, I've kept those. I'm glad he named those six. As mentioned up front, many is a time I've heard people say to me that they thought they merited eternal life because they were good people. Yes, I'm a good guy. I think I'll have eternal life if I die today. Sin is not my problem. I've kept the commandments. Even though every one of these people that say that actually knew that they weren't nearly as good as they said they were, and it's probably the very same with this young man here. Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Even though that he could say that he kept these six commandments, he knew in his heart that something was still missing. That's why he came to Jesus in the first place. That's why he came running. Notice that Jesus limited himself here in his list of these commandments to just the commandments that can be kept outwardly, observably. For others to see. Verse 19, Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Defraud not. Honor thy father and mother. People say to me, I never killed anyone. I've been faithful to my wife. I've never stolen anything. I've kept these commandments. You know, that's what the people say to me. And when they say that to me, the first thing I always say is, Have you ever, ever told a lie? Have you ever told a lie? If they dare to say no to me, of course, then I say... That's a lie right there. You just told another one. Notice that Jesus skipped over a few of the most important commandments here. Those that are actually matters of the heart rather than of outward observance. Many commandments of the law could be kept somewhat easily with outward observance. That's why, of course, the general impression of the Pharisees was that they were the ones that kept the law. But Jesus said they kept the law outwardly, but inside they were dead, full of dead men's bones. Paul said in Romans, Romans chapter 7, verse 7, Paul said, I had not known sin but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, Paul said, and taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, evil desires. For without the law, sin was dead. Paul said, I could keep the law outwardly, but the law says, Thou shalt not covet. That's a matter of the heart. And Paul said, I couldn't do that. It's interesting that Paul cites this commandment at this verse instead of the others. Paul himself said that he had been a Pharisee of Pharisees. The Hebrew of the Hebrews, right? The Pharisees are great at putting on an outward show of obedience to the law. Those that can be observed outwardly. It's the matters of the heart that they have trouble with. Same with Pharisees today, by the way. Those that say they've kept the Ten Commandments, and I've been told by some that they do. First of all, they can't even list what those commandments are. And secondly, they can't even make it past the first one. Exodus 20, verse 2. God says, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Notice that Jesus did not quote this first commandment. This young man, thou shalt have no other god before me. Because Jesus knew that this young man had another god. Jesus knew that this man was an idolater who loved his money more than he loved God. Notice that Jesus did not quote, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, with all thy strength, with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. But without quoting those commandments, Jesus went directly to what this young man would have to do to keep those very commandments of the heart. Verse 21, Then Jesus beholding him, loved him, and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, Sell whatever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross, and follow me. That's what this young man would have to do in order to keep the commandments. To to love the Lord his God with all of his heart. At this verse, I have a very important point that's contrary to the heretical notes in the Schofield Reference Bible. Jesus here is not preaching salvation by works as many accuse him of in this story. They accuse Jesus of preaching salvation by works here. Well, you've got to sell all this stuff and follow me. That's what you've got to do to be saved. It's not what Jesus is saying here. He's trying to bring this young man to a point of repentance. I've got a newsflash for all independent Baptist dispensationalists who have 
bought into C.I. Schofield's damnable heresy that many today are still propagating, that Jesus' ministry was that of Old Testament law, that Jesus preached a different gospel than Paul preached, that the gospel of the kingdom that he preached was a gospel of works for salvation. Here's the newsflash. Your fundamentalism is fundamentally flawed. Grace and truth did not come by the Apostle Paul. We read in John 1, verse 17, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Grace and truth did not come by the Apostle Paul. It came through the Lord Jesus Christ. And furthermore, the Lord Jesus Christ and the Apostle Paul preached the same gospel. Throughout his ministry, the Lord Jesus preached a gospel of grace, a gospel of justification by faith alone, apart from works. Over and over in his ministry, over and over, he said, if you believe on me, you shall have eternal life. Throughout the Gospels we read this. The Lord Jesus and the Apostle Paul preached the same Gospel. First of all, both the Lord Jesus and the Apostles preached a Gospel of regeneration, that you must be born again. Jesus said in John chapter 3, verse 3, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus said you must be regenerated. You preach that Gospel. Matthew 18, verse 3, Jesus said, Except you be converted, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. You've got to be converted. You've got to be born again, Jesus said. Likewise, Paul also said about the same thing in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. He said, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Peter also, almost quoting Jesus in 1 Peter 1, verse 23. Peter said, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Peter says it's through the hearing and the believing of the Word of God, that we can be born again. Both the Lord Jesus and the Apostles preached that you must be born again. Secondly, both the Lord Jesus and the Apostle Paul preached justification by faith alone. After telling Nicodemus that he had to be born again, the Lord Jesus then went on to tell him how to do that. In John chapter 3, verse 16, Jesus said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That, of course, in those two verses, is the gospel in a nutshell. Same gospel that Paul preached, same gospel that we preach. This is the gospel in a nutshell. Justification by grace through faith alone. That doesn't say the Father sent the Son to offer an earthly kingdom to Israel but that the world through him might be saved. So, Schofieldism is heresy. John 3, verse 36, Jesus said, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. That's salvation by grace through faith. That's not salvation by works. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. John 5, 24, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death to life already. He's made that change. He's been born again. Jesus did not preach salvation by works to the Jews as a fundamental Schofieldite dispensationalist typically accuse him. In John chapter 6, verse 28, we read, And then they said unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? They asked him, what, what do we need to do to work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. Justification by faith alone, apart from works. By the way, C.S. Schofield was a liar. The Lord Jesus did not come to minister the law to Old Testament Israel. And did not preach the gospel of works Good works for salvation. Both the Lord Jesus and the Apostle Paul preached justification by faith alone. Third, both the Lord Jesus and Paul and the other apostles as well preached that you must come to repentance from sin to be saved. They all preached that. Matthew 9, verse 13, Jesus said to the Pharisees, But go and learn what this meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. Jesus said, For I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. 
Repentance from what? From sin. The righteous don't think they need to repent of their sin. Jesus said, I've come to call sinners to repent of their sin. The Lord Jesus preached the gospel of repentance and said that we are to do that also. I mentioned many times in Luke, in Luke chapter 24 in the risen Savior's appearance of the two men on the road to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. Luke records this in verse 45, Luke 24. And open he their understanding. They'd been walking along with him on the road. He was talking with them. They didn't even know who he was. Didn't recognize him. But then verse 45, then he opened their understanding that they might, that they might understand the scriptures and said unto them, thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. That's exactly what the apostles did. That's exactly what we are supposed to do. We are supposed to preach repentance and remission of sins, not just remission of sins. Paul's sermon on, Mar on Mars Hill in Acts chapter 17, verse 30. Paul said in the time, this is to the, to the pagans here gathered in Athens. Paul said, to the times of this ignorance, God has winked at. He's, he's looked the other way. But now commandeth all men everywhere, Paul said, to repent. Because he hath appointed a day, and in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. Paul preached the gospel of repentance. Paul said in Acts chapter 20, to the Ephesian elders, verse 20, Paul says, How I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you, and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and to the, and to the Greeks, Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance first, faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Second Peter chapter 3, the Apostle Peter said, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, Peter said, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. To repentance. Peter chooses that word repentance there. He didn't say that all men should come to the cross or come to Christ. Until a man comes to repentance, he cannot come to Christ or to the cross. And when he does come to repentance, he will also come both to Christ and to the cross. Contrary to what easy believism teaches. Repentance and saving faith are inseparable. In many places that word repentance is actually used synonymously with salvation. Acts 11:18. We read when they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, "Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life." Second Peter 3 verse 9. We just read that. The Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That word repentance is used synonymously with salvation. It all should come to repentance. Furthermore, repentance is a prerequisite to salvation. First of all, repentance and saving faith are inseparable. Secondly, repentance is a prerequisite to salvation. We read, that's why Jesus said in Luke 24, verse 47, we just read that, that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. That's why Paul told Herod Agrippa in Acts chapter 26, verse 20, that he showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God and do works, meet for repentance, said the Apostle Paul. In Acts chapter 3, that's why Peter said in his uh, sermon in Acts chapter 3, verse 19, Peter said, Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Repent ye therefore and be converted. And then Peter elaborated as to what he meant there by repentance. He defined the repentance that he had in view there that, preceded, that precedes conversion. He said that was turning from sin, not just from unbelief. That's why he said just a few verses later in verse 26. Unto you, first God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you and turning away every one of you from your iniquities from your iniquities. That's how Peter defined repentance, turning away from your iniquities. That's how he defines the repentance that accompanies conversion and accompanies salvation. 
Peter says that repentance is an element of saving faith that is prerequisite to salvation. Before a man will come to Christ, he must come to a recognition that he is a sinner on his way to hell. And that's what the Lord Jesus is trying to bring this man on the road to recognize, that he is a sinner on his way to hell. He must be brought to a point of godly sorrow over his sin. He must desire to be free from that sin. That's why Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, and verse 10, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. I'm going to repeat again a quote I've often used of how one uh, preacher defines uh, repentance. I forget who the preacher was. But he correctly wrote um, this of Peter's message here in Acts chapter 3. He said, when the word repent is used in the word of God in the context of biblical salvation, it is referring to a truly God-given, spirit-led change of heart and mind toward God about sin. Quoting Acts 3.19, he said, Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. He says, The greatest need for any sinner is to have his sins blotted out, but a man will never have the pardon of sin while he is in love with his sin. There must be a hatred of sin, a loathing of it, a turning from it. Repentance, he said, is a revolution in dealing with our attitude and view towards sin and righteousness. Great definition. He said, repentance is not something one does with his hands, but it is an inward attitude of the soul. In other words, it's not works for salvation. He said, sin must become in the eyes of the sinner exceedingly sinful. So, when Jesus said to this rich young ruler in Mark chapter 10, verse 21, one thing thou lackest, go thy way, Sell whatever thou hast and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross and follow me. He's not preaching salvation by works. Jesus is here actually very tenderly and graciously trying to get this young man to see that he's a sinner. He's trying to bring this young man to a point of repentance, which you have to do before people will get saved. He didn't get out his gospel tract, you know, and go through the five things you need to know to be saved. First, he had to get this this young man to a point where he would actually see step one, that he was a sinner. And that all has sinned and falls short of the glory of God. But this young man was not ready to repent of his idolatrous love of money. Verse 22, and he was sad at that saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. Notice that Jesus did not... Chase him down and say, well, actually, okay, all you got to do is say the sinner's prayer. You just repeat this prayer after me and you'll, you can be saved. Jesus let the man walk. He let him walk. He didn't, didn't follow him. We read. Jesus loved this man. He loved him, but he let him walk. Even though he loved him. Sometimes all we can do is plant a seed in people's lives. And let people know that they are in sin. Sometimes that's all we can do. And a few came to Jesus thinking that you can hold on to your sin. You came to the wrong Jesus. We don't need to deceive people in thinking that they can hold on to their sin so we can get them to pray the sinner's prayer, so we can play our numbers games and, and say that we got them saved, which is exactly what the Hiles crowd does in this false repentance-free gospel of easy believism. They, don't, they want to count heads in the churches and in their Sunday schools. It's all a big numbers game. This man may have repented, possibly at a later date. We don't know. We read in verse 23. And Jesus looked round about and saith unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answereth again and saith unto them, Children, how hard it is for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. He says it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Now we read, and they were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, who then can be saved? Because, of course, they thought, if you're rich, it must be because you have God's blessing. If a rich man can't be saved, who can be saved? Jesus, looking upon them, saith, with men it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. Some try to say here that Jesus is saying 
is merely saying it is difficult for a rich man to enter the kingdom because it's difficult for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. They, some say that the eye of a needle here is the, some gate in Jerusalem that's very difficult for a camel to get through. No, that's not what Jesus is saying here. It's not just difficult, Jesus said, for a rich man to enter the kingdom. It is impossible. With men it is impossible, Jesus said. But not with God, for with God all things are possible. We read in Isaiah 59, verse 1 to 2, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. God surely can save a rich man, but not until that rich man is brought to a place of repentance for idolizing money over God himself. And that's what Jesus was trying to get this man to do. In this event, on the road to Jerusalem, that's exactly what the Lord Jesus is trying to get this man to do. He's trying to bring this man to repentance. Because until a man sees himself as he is, as a dirty, rotten sinner, he will see no need to lay his treasures aside and follow Jesus, to love the Lord with all of his heart. The greatest lesson of this account is not about the vanity of worldly wealth or the deceitfulness of riches. The greatest lesson of this account is the necessity of repentance as a prerequisite to salvation. I think that's the most important lesson in this, in this story. This man's idol that kept him from coming to Christ was his riches. For others, it may be their drugs or their alcohol. Jesus said it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. He could just as truthfully said... It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle uh, than for an alcoholic to enter the kingdom of God or for an adulterer to enter the kingdom of God or for a thief or a murderer or a homosexual sodomite to enter into the kingdom of God. He could have said any of those things. That's, of course, why the Apostle Paul, the preacher of grace, by the way, the preacher of grace said in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9 to 11, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Paul says, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Then he says, of course, and such were some of you. Paul says, but ye are washed, ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God, justified, declared righteous. I reject the notion that some teach at this passage that the kingdom spoken of here in this passage is merely the uh, the thousand year uh, reign of Christ, millennium. That doctrine uh, teaches that a Christian can hold on to his sin, but he'll, he can be one of these things, an adulterer, extortioner, reviler, but he'll be excluded from that aspect of the kingdom, that thousand year reign of Christ. I repeat that if you came to Jesus thinking that you can hold on to your sin, you came to the wrong Jesus. Until a man sees himself as he is, as a dirty, rotten sinner, he will see no need to lay his treasures aside and follow Jesus. Repentance must precede salvation. Mark 10, verse 22, I believe is one of the saddest verses in the Bible. The young ruler was probably a good man in the eyes of the world. But Jesus said, you have to choose between me and your idols, your riches. He chose his riches. And his riches may have ultimately kept him actually out of the kingdom of God. Good people. People who think that they're good, and whom the world may see as good, but who refuse to be willing to part with their sin, cannot enter the kingdom of God. The Lord Jesus requires of us the same thing that he asked of this young man, that we are willing to forsake all and follow him. He expects the same thing of us. Matthew chapter 8, verse 34, we read, When he had called the people unto him, with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake, and the gospel is the same, shall save it. Jesus said, For what shall it profit a man? He shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul. 
So in your life, what is it that's keeping you from taking up the cross and serving Jesus? Whatever it is, if it stands between you and your doing what you know to be the will of God, it is an idol from which you must repent. The Lord Jesus is not going to chase you down and make you repent. He's not going to do that. He'll let you walk if you choose to. But I suggest that you instead choose to run to Jesus, repent of the idols in your life, and to follow him. I suggest that you do that if you haven't done that already. Let's go ahead and pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we do thank you for this story. We thank you for what it shows us about what we must do to follow you, all of us. I pray for those here that perhaps have not ever trusted Christ as their Savior, that they would have heard this message. They would have heard that you so love the world that you sent your only begotten Son into this world to die for our sins on that cross of Calvary so that all who believe in him should be able to receive eternal life. If there's one here that has not done that, Lord, I pray that they would do that today. Amen.